It's my very great pleasure to welcome everybody to the 8th Australian Academy of Humanities Hancock Lecture. My name's Graham Oppie, I'm a philosopher from Monash University. I'm liaison for early career researchers on the Council of the Academy. There's a bunch of things that the Academy does for early career researchers. I'll just mention a few of them here. There's the Max Crawford Medal, there's the Hancock Lecture, there's the McCready Musicological Award, there's the Humanities Travelling Fellowship, and there's the Publication Subsidy, among others. Uh, we also have a new research initiative that's funded by the ARC, Learned Academy Special Project on the Future Humanities Workforce, and that has a big focus on careers that are going to be available to um, scholars in the humanities in the next couple of decades. Finally, I thought I'd mention the revived poster program uh, which, at, at, at this symposium, which I think was an enormous success. I'm very impressed. I went and talked to a few of the people who had a look at the poster. I think it was wonderful. The Hancock Lecture is named in honour of one of, I guess, one of the dwarves of Australian historians, Sir. William Keith Hancock, and then there's the usual alphabetical confetti after that. The most important part of which is FAHA. He was one of the foundation fellows of the Academy, and he was also the first president from 1969 to 1971. Uh, he was a scholar of great range, um, the breadth of intellectual curiosity. Towards the end of his life, he was working on Leonardo da Vinci and um, Salination of the Murray River. Um, those were two independent projects. The last two, the last two things, the last two seminars that he did, one was on Da Vinci, the other one was on the Murray River. Um, one thing to know about the Hancock lecture, I guess, so this is the eighth, from the previous seven, there are four people who've gone on to become fellows. Of the Academy, Glenda Sluger, Megan Morris, Susan Lawrence, and Christine Alexander. Okay, today's lecture is given by Dr. Rahan Ishmael. Rahan's from the Centre for Arab and Islamic Studies at the Australian National University. Uh, she specialises in culture, gender, religion, and politics in the Middle East. Uh, since 2015, She's been co-convener for government departments and agencies of the political Islam seminar series. Um, she's a regular media commentator, both here and overseas. She's been on various television shows and on radio and so on. She's the author of the 2016 Oxford University Press book called Saudi Clerics and Shia Islam. And this year, 2018, she was joint recipient of the 2018 Max Crawford Medal. Um, the other recipient was Anna Tanishoka from the University of Canberra. The lecture today is titled Hybrid Civilizations or Clash of Civilizations, Revisiting with Some Other, and what we're going to get uh, is some stuff about vibrant debates in Muslim societies, um, challenging notions of the homogeneity of cultures, religions, and civilizations. Please welcome Dr. Rayhan Ishmael. custodians of this land and pay my respects to the elders, both past and present. Um, thank you so much, uh, Professor Graham, for your kind introduction. 
Um, and thank you. Um, you know, I would like to take, to take this opportunity to actually thank Professor Bronwyn Neal and Professor Katrina McKinsey for um, organizing the event and also for having me on board and the Academy for having me on board. It is such a great honor to be here and to be given the opportunity to deliver the eighth Hancock Lecture. So I'm very pleased. Um, I also want to thank my mother-in-law and her friends um, for attending the talk today, Robin Chapman and uh, Robin and John for being here. So you can imagine I'm under a lot of pressure. <laughs> so I'm very pleased to be discussing a contentious topic which continues to be invoked in certain circles. So in 2014, following the rise of ISIS, the Australian published this headline on its front page. We'll fight Islam for 100 years. And last Saturday, the Australian in response to the Burke Street attacks published on its front page, violent Islam strikes again. This sense of ongoing conflict with Islam seems perpetual, as Islam to some um, represents values, traditions, um, and visions that are at odds with the rest of the world. So the Burke Street attacks also witness divisive rhetorical fire propagated by some Australian politicians, um, blaming Muslim communities uh, for not doing enough, um, Prime Minister actually said that. The rhetoric gives an impression that there is an expectation that Muslims, wherever you are, and whoever you are, must be held accountable for the conduct of every Muslim, simply because you share the same religion. This is an opportune moment to discuss the Clash of Civilizations thesis. And this is because when we think about the Muslim world and the conflict ravaging Muslim countries, some analysts, politicians, uh, and even academics continue to invoke the clash of civilizations thesis to show how Islam is actually incompatible with the modern world. As we all know, the thesis was initially developed by Bernard Lewis, who was a British-American historian based at Princeton University, Lewis died in May 2018, but left a legacy that continues to shape the perception of the Muslim world by others. And in his words, it should by now be clear that we are facing a mood and a movement in Islam, far transcending the level of issues and policies and the government that pursue them. This is no less than a clash of civilizations. And of course, we know that Huntington um, developed the idea further. He emphasized the propensity of Islam for violence. He offered policy advice that recommended limiting the influence of Islam by tightening immigration and minority rights. And Huntington vehemently denounced multiculturalism, arguing that it diluted the basic foundations of America. And of course, you know, he also propagated um, or, you know, main, to him, maintaining Western military superiority over other civilizations, especially against Islam, is crucial. Following September 11, his thesis became more relevant than ever. Some scholars, including Leif Saud, argued that Huntington's clash of civilizations was no more than a self-fulfilling prophecy that U.S. policymakers, who had adhered to his advice, had created an interventionist American foreign policy. And this, in turn, had galvanized anti-American sentiment in the Muslim world and empowered radical elements in Muslim societies. And the rise of ISIS revived the debate. After all, an abhorrent group like ISIS easily excites anger, from the Paris attacks to Orlando to the enslavement of Yazidi women under the guise of Islam, debates over Islam and its shortcomings dominated Western media outlets and the rhetoric of politicians from America to Europe to Australia. Everything about Islam is scrutinized. Some, in search for an answer to understand the brutality of ISIS, 
nominate the clash of civilizations thesis as an explanation that Islam in general is incompatible with Western values and ISIS simply adheres to authentic Islam. This means that those who clearly articulate a different version of Islam are simply downplaying the violent and regressive nature of the religion. In an article published by Graham Bradley, the former president of the Business Council of Australia, unfortunately it's recorded, so he's going to have to find out. Um, in the Financial Review, he criticized Noam Chomsky for rejecting Huntington's thesis. In Bradley's words, he, referring to Chomsky, and many other critics have been remarkably silent on the atro atrocities committed by Islamist terrorist groups around the world over the past few years. They too should now reflect, this was published in 2014, they too should now reflect on whether Huntington was more right than wrong, and policy makers would do well to revisit Huntington's foresightful essay. So the clash of civilizations thesis is equally celebrated by extremist elements. The thesis advances their claims that Islam, their version of course, is incompatible with, um, incompatible with corrupt and treacherous Western values. And that's the argument that ISIS made. Since its inception, the clash of civilizations thesis has been met with rigorous intellectual admonition. And I think we've seen that yesterday, and we continue to see that today. Particularly, you know, we've looked at a number of um, sessions yesterday and today, looking at um, the clash of civilizations thesis. Edward Said, of course, you know, people have been mentioning Edward Said throughout the symposium. He was a public intellectual at Columbia University. Debunked, he debunked the thesis, um, and other scholars similarly questioned the validity of the thesis. What I'm hoping to do is I will try and examine some of the ideas put forward by these scholars within the framework of Islam and drawing from some of the themes discussed yesterday. So a consistent theme that we've examined throughout the symposium is the very definition of Western civilization. What are Western values? There are many interpretations of what Western civilization represents. The clash of civilizations thesis, as many have argued, is simplistic and reductionist. It ignores the nuances within various societies, cultures, and nations. The notion of Western civilization is often treated as self-explanatory. The proponents of the preservation of Western civilization have an elusive conception of what they're trying to preserve and what they're trying to protect. If Western civilization refers to its religious mores and customs. It must include the Middle Eastern tradition, I suppose, uh, of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And I think uh, Robert Bullitt, the historian of medieval Islam, deals with the subject extensively. The Christian tradition was also shaped by Christian scholars in the Middle East, uh, who were based in Syrian monasteries, Egyptian Coptic churches, and in Turkey. And these scholars were crucial in the development of Christianity in Western Europe. The panel on ancient conflicts yesterday demonstrated a number of examples which clearly showed the vibrant intellectual interactions among scholars during the medieval period. Similarly, if Western civilization identifies with the achievements of the Roman Empire, the Middle East cannot be excluded as much of the Middle East was part of the Roman Empire. And some, on the other hand, you know, argue that Western civilization is the achievements of Western Europe. If this is the case, what about the Muslim and the Jewish contribution in Spain, in terms of knowledge and scientific development? As there is no single interpretation of Islam, there is no one version of Western civilization, and that is what we've concluded, at least in the symposium. Others will probably disagree. Um, Western, uh, there is no you know, one version of Western civilization or even uniform Western values. For example, Western societies continue to debate social political issues such as same-sex marriage, abortion, and even secularism. 
the notion or the French notion of secularism differs from the American version. Meanwhile, the proponents of the clash of civilization's thesis look at Islam as incompatible with the West. The most extreme elements are taken as representative of the Islamic faith. The vibrant theological and political debates within Islam are often ignored. We all know that Islam is heavily contested within Muslim societies as lay intellectuals, religious scholars, modernist clerics, secular activists, political Islamists and other actors have different claims over Islam. The debate within Islam precedes the modern world and continues to color the interactions between Muslims. Lewis, Huntington and others like them are also critical of Islamic culture and Islamic values. And based on what I've said earlier, what is Islamic culture? There are 1.5 to 1.7 billion, 1 billion Muslims who share different cultures and traditions. And Islam in practice differs from one place to another. And this was another theme that was discussed yesterday in various ways. But I would add that the clash of civilization's thesis also treats culture and tradition as static and incapable of changing. And even when we think of Western civilization, what it represents changes over time, in Western societies as well. Western values and culture are modified and continue to be reconstructed. <clears throat> Islam and Muslim societies are the same. Cultures, values, interpretations of doctrines have evolved and have changed over time. Traditions are modified and constructed. Some are positively developed, while others take a regressive turn. One of my favorite authors, Eric Hobsbawm and Terence Ranger, um, discuss in their famous book, The Invention of Tradition, how societies reinvent traditions for various purposes. And Trevor Roper, who wrote a chapter in the book, discusses the Highland tradition of Scotland as a modern construct developed to assert identity in the context of the union with England. The kilt was regarded um, by the large majority of Scotchmen in his words as a sign of barbarism, the badge of roguish predatory black mailing highlanders who were more of a nuisance than a threat to civilize historic Scotland. Yet today, the kilt and the bagpipe represent a distinctive national identity. In Muslim societies, jihadi groups like ISIS similarly radicalize and reinvent religious traditions. The fingered salute, which symbolizes the oneness of God, used by Muslims in prayers, has been defined. ISIS militants pose with decapitated heads on one hand and display the fingered salute with the other. In order for ISIS to appear legitimate, Islamic symbols and practices are used to provide some sense of continuity, giving an impression to the naked eye that they are adhering to religious tradition. Traditions are also positively reinvented uh, to bring social-political reforms in Muslim societies, where existing interpretations of Islam are challenged by reformist Muslims. The reform efforts in Muslim societies um, encompass gender equality, rights of minority groups, liberalization of Islam, and these reform efforts take within the framework of Islam. These Muslims speak of reform without rejecting the essence of Islam, especially the spiritual comfort it offers. So the clash of civilization's thesis is meant to demonstrate in many ways the collective superiority of Western civilization over others. It also appears to warn those belonging to Western civilization of the hostility directed towards them by other civilizations, especially Islamic civilization. Huntington did not shy away from making these claims. However, claims of superiority are an indication of a lack of understanding of others. This in turn contributes to othering, demonization, and dehumanization of the inferior
superior and violent other. In the so-called state of perpetual hostility, the proponents of the clash of civilizations argue that multiculturalism cannot succeed as migration brings people of diverse backgrounds. They reinforce the belief that people of different religious, cultural backgrounds cannot coexist. How do we then deconstruct such notions of the perpetuity of the clash of civilizations? And I think going back to Edward Said, he examines the different civilizations not as rigid categories. According to him, civilizations interact, making the watertight, you know, I'm quoting him, watertight compartmentalization of civilizations inaccurate. Differences should be viewed as strengths, not a threat. That is why some argue that civilizations are hybrids. Different civilizations learn, learn and absorb from each other as the world is interconnected through networks of human capital. Islam's Abbasid dynasty under Caliph Ma'mun revived Hellenistic traditions, translating the works of Greek philosophers such as Plato and Aristotle, which had been lost and forgotten. The revived works were later transported to Europe they became crucial for the foundations of Western political thought. And similarly, with the advancements made by Western powers in the 19th century, Muslim reformists looked to Europe to revive Islamic glory. In the words of Muhammad Abdu in the 19th century, I went to the West, I saw Islam and no Muslims. I came back to the East, I saw Muslims and no Islam. Abdu basically argued that the depressing predicament of Muslim societies would be explained by the fact that they had regressed. While the West had embraced Islamic ideals, he looked to Europe to revive the study of sciences and placed importance on education and women's empowerment. And therefore, as Said argues, rigid categorization of civilizations and the argument that civilizations are incapable of interacting with each other in a positive manner is not only inaccurate but dangerously dismissive of others. And more importantly, the watertight compartmentalization creates a separate other, inferior in achievements, values, and sophistication. And these arguments strip the humanity of the separate other, portraying them as a nuisance at best and the enemy at worst. These arguments undermine the multiculturalism that is inevitable in modern societies. Those belonging to separate cultures or civilizations are constantly perceived as incapable of integrating, especially minority groups in Western societies. The us and them mentality disrupts social harmony as it creates a sense of separation difference, but more importantly, facilitates the process of othering, leaving communities and individuals who do not belong to the dominant culture or race, suffocated by the pressure to prove their loyalty and trustworthiness. We have seen how Muslims are depicted in media outlets. I think Rani Latif Fatah talked about it extensively yesterday. More recently, Australians of Sudanese backgrounds have been targeted by sensationalized news on African gang violence. We are still yet to break this vicious cycle. We are still here. It is unfortunate, but the clash of civilizations thesis remains resilient. We're still revisiting the clash of civilizations thesis. We're also dealing with an ongoing discourse of how Western civilizations triumphs and need to be preserved. Any effort to reconcile the West and the Muslim world is destined to fail, according to some. Only one sophisticated civilization will survive the test of time. As former Prime Minister Tony Abbott puts it in his quest uh, to introduce the study of Western civilization, I've just got to mention that. Um, through the Ramsey Center, the Western civilization degree is not merely about Western civilization, but in favor of it. This narrative reverberates across various parts of Europe and North America. 
There is a degree of fear on the part of certain elements in Western societies. They fear that they're losing their tradition. And I know we've had a session this morning talking about tradition. What does it mean? Right? And I think that's quite important. But at least that sense that they're feeling, or they, you know, they fear that they're losing their tradition, culture, values, and identity. They fear that the existing political order in Western societies has little appreciation for the efforts to preserve the gains made by Western thinkers, explorers, and inventors. They fear that the encroachment of the barbaric other will dilute the authenticity of Western ideals. The Clash of Civilizations thesis is a manifestation of the fear, not caused by illegal immigrants, or as in America, what would you call it, aliens, like illegal aliens. Um, but it is a manifestation of the fear caused by growing global instability lack of opportunities domestically and the disruption of identities due to growing inequality, movement of people and the changing nature of the global world. These destabilizing conditions create a sense of urgency to preserve what is familiar, identity, values, tradition. This is despite the fact that what is familiar is often elusive and more importantly, Imagine with no tangible reality. Benedict Anderson argues that the nation is socially constructed, imagined by the people who perceive themselves as part of that group. It deals with the formation of a shared national identity. Those who belong to this imagined political community view themselves as a homogenous entity. And some, some would even go as far as envisioning a shared destiny because of this collective national identity. And this is despite the fact that they may never meet each other in their lives. Um, and that's the argument made by Benedict Anderson. And there are issues with his work, of course, but I'm not going to touch uh, on the subject. However, drawing from his work, it can be argued that Western civilization is also imagined and socially constructed. The Paris attacks witness a worldwide condemnation um, in which world leaders marched together against terrorism. Obama called it an attack on all of humanity. However, Rupert Murdoch declared that Paris outrage, not an attack on all humanity, but an attack on us, Western civilization. Obviously, not everyone is fond of Rupert Murdoch's divisive rhetoric. <laughs> However, even subconsciously, the imagined sense of belonging exists among members of the so-called Western civilization. Australian and international media outlets, including the ABC, the BBC, displayed the horrors of the Paris attacks and published the names, pictures, and the stories of the victims in commemoration of their memories. However, the same attention was not given to the victims of ISIS massacres in Afghanistan, Syria, and Pakistan, who remained nameless and faceless. They were just numbers. Are we all that different? That's a good question. <coughs> um, Western, <coughs> Eastern. One question to be asked, if other traditions, cultures, and value systems are not inferior, I'm trying to be provocative here. Just... Yes, if other traditions, cultures, and value systems are not inferior, why are some plagued with political backwardness, conflict, and a depressing state of misery in comparison to Western society? And we have to answer this question because that's a question that many would ask. Even those who are very sympathetic, deep inside, they ask that question as well, right? The news emerging from some parts of the Middle East and Muslim societies are confronting. Perhaps blaming value systems, religions, and cultures which are not monolithic anyway is misleading. The social political circumstances of these societies prevent them from making the advances required for development. 
economic mismanagement increases poverty, reducing societal capacity to enhance its education system, which is crucial for progress. Similarly, ongoing conflict and the crippling effects of authoritarianism stunt and paralyze intellectual development. Global inequality paralyzes the ability of poorer countries to provide the services required to enhance the living standards of their peoples or citizens. We are confronted with the depressing predicament of Muslim women um, in Muslim societies. I'm giving you know, a lecture, the Hancock lecture. You have to talk about Muslim women. Um, the treatment of women in Muslim societies is subject to intense criticism, denunciation, and even justification for war. Besides destroying Saddam Hussein's non-existent um, weapons of mass destruction, George W. Bush articulated the need to liberate Iraqi women to justify the invasion of Iraq. Today, Iraqi women are in a worse state than ever. The invasion destroyed state infrastructure, crippled the economy, and created ongoing security threats for women. However, the, the question is, do we have the necessary understanding of Muslim societies when we are passing judgment or enacting policies? However, more often than not, we are asking the wrong questions. And we are completely unaware of the internal dynamics of Muslim societies. We want to help, but do we really understand Muslim women or Muslim societies? To illustrate this, I will draw from the works of Layla Abu Lhud, who published a book titled, Do Muslim Women Need Saving? Um, she interviewed women from the Middle East and asked them if they felt disempowered or oppressed and these women admit to ongoing oppression in their communities. They speak of their grievances. However, when asked whether or not Islam oppresses them, these women were shocked and puzzled. They relate that the reason they feel oppressed is because state authorities threaten to destroy their stalls if they uh, do not pay protection money. A Palestinian woman blames the Israeli occupation for her grievances as she feels paralyzed by the lack of freedom and occupation. And more importantly, when asked about their faith, they narrate that when they go home, they sit on their prayer mat, they cry, they pray to God, and they find comfort. This is not to say that Muslim women are not victimized by cultural practices or regressive interpretations of Islam. Female genital mutilation, and I have to use horrible examples, um, it's after lunch, I'm sure everyone's really sleeping. Um, so female genital mutilation is often used as an example of how cultural and religious practices in Islam oppress women. The infamous, uh, the infamous Ayan Hirsi Ali denounces Islam for a number of reasons, but is perhaps best known for her condemnation of FGM in Muslim societies. However, her lack of understanding of the subject of FGM leads to misconceptions. For one, there is no religious justification for the practice, not in the Quran and not in the Prophet's tradition. And second, it is practiced in some African countries, as we all know, including among Christian communities. It is not a common practice in Saudi Arabia, despite the fact that Saudi Arabia is perhaps one of the most conservative Muslim countries. The practice is still widespread in Egypt, where young girls continue to die from the procedure. This is despite the fact that the Grand Mufti of Al-Azhar, which is the bastion of Sunni Islam, um, issued a religious ruling that condemns FGM, arguing that it is against Islam. Many, especially in rural areas and low-income neighborhoods in Egypt, still believe that the practice is an obligation in Islam. And today, both male and female activists in Egypt travel all over the country, including clerics, to educate Egyptians of the dangers of FGM. <coughs> Poverty, lack of education, political paralysis, make reform difficult. These debilitating circumstances prevent the development required to change the state of societies. 
They slow down societal evolution or changes initiated by local actors, including reformists and activists who are trying to change the destiny of their societies. Western societies have also gone through a process of gradual transformation or evolution. In the 1950s Australia, unwed mothers were ostracized. Their children taken from them and institutionalized. Some witness horrific abuses as well. Today, such practices are not only socially frowned upon, but criminalized. Even if we accept the clash of civilizations thesis at face value, that Western civilization is homogenous, more advanced, and more sophisticated because of the achievements made in scientific discoveries, stable political systems, and strong institutions that are devoid of corruption, one question remains. What were the factors that contributed to the successful state of Western democracies today? Was it civilizational isolation? Or was there a superior civilization imposing its values on Western societies, forcing it to develop? Western societies dealt with their inner demons without the aggressive intervention of those who are viewed as outside the Western world. Westerns, like others, Muslim societies continue to battle their inner demons including dealing with bigotry, inequality, and abhorrent practices in the name of religion, culture, um, and the preservation of outdated tradition. However, Muslims also have to deal with external hatred and prejudice. You're dealing with your own problems, but on top of that, you're dealing with the perception that you are so regressive and backwards. The anti-Muslim rhetoric reduces the capacity of reformists to promote progress as attempts to introduce genuine liberalization are conflated with Western imposition on Muslims. Many Muslims remain traumatized by colonialism and external interventions that have only destabilized their communities. In the case of Iraq, um, destroyed their community. The clash of civilizations thesis is chauvinistic, as others are treated with contempt. The process of othering reduces the importance of empathy, which is a crucial trait for the survival of humanity. The civilizational divide is often imagined and cannot be sustained as the global world is interconnected more than ever. Cultural and civilizational hybridity are unavoidable. Huntington's thesis was formulated outside the existing framework of nation states. He examined the collective consciousness of Western ideals predicated upon neoliberalism, freedom, and the notion of equality. There is a need to propagate a collective consciousness in today's world. It is perhaps important to move away from the state-centric approaches to dealing with problems facing the world. However, Huntington's way of dividing the world between the good, represented by the West, and evil, or between the civilized, also represented by the West, and backwards, does not make the world a better place. Yuval Harari, uh, Noah Harari, an Israeli historian, tackles the subject. We are part of the global community. We are dealing with pressing problems that are global in nature, from climate change to the refugee crisis to the global financial crisis. There is a need to find a common solution or to find common solutions. Even when we are dealing with terrorism, it is not a problem for the West alone. It is a problem confronting humanity. In Harari's words, ISIS may indeed pose a radical challenge, but the civilization it challenges is a global civilization rather than a uniquely Western phenomenon. We are global citizens, where different cultures, religions, ethnicities are to be celebrated, where we engage with each other respectfully. Cosmopolitanism emphasizes that we are all citizens of the world. It recognizes the world as diverse, 
are interconnected. And David Held examines the evolution of cosmopolitanism as an idea, tracing it back to Stoicism, a school of Hellenistic philosophy. In his words, we inhabit two worlds, one that is local and assigned to us by birth, and another that is truly great and truly common. Each person lives in both a local community and a wider community of human ideals, aspirations, and argument. The Stoics propagate that loyalty should be given to first and foremost to humanity and not to ethnicity, class, and nation. The question is, how can we implement cosmopolitan principles in a world that is governed by nation states and nationalism for more than 200 years? If anything, with the revival of populist politics, cosmopolitanism is only a philosophical endeavor with no realistic structures. However, cosmopolitanism has gradually permeated our world with the establishment of global norms and legal frameworks. We have global institutions promoting universal norms such as the United Nations. Despite this, these institutions are also restricted by powerful states. Uh, which make global governance complicated. We've seen how the United Nations Security Council's veto, veto power undermines human rights. Syria, Ukraine um, come to mind. Professor Schultz talked about strengthening our institutions yesterday, and I absolutely agree with that, as strong institutions are crucial for stability, equality, and the promotion of a just political order. These issues continue to be debated by scholars working in the field. David Held speaks of cosmopolitan law, where global institutions are governed, uh, are governed by principles that would enhance the protection of humanity. And according to him, um, cosmopolitan law is already enshrined in international law, governed by principles of equality, equal worth and dignity, um, inclusiveness and justice. I'm not suggesting that the cosmopolitan alternative is easy to be implemented and we are able to change the entrenched nation-state structures. And more importantly, nationalism can also be a good thing. It can mobilize people to do the right thing. Uh, the drought crisis that is hitting our farmers witness Australians coming together to help. The idea that we belong uh, to this political community and we have a responsibility to help our fellow citizens should not be undermined. However, it is also important to extend this sense of belonging and inclusiveness to the global community, especially disenfranchised and marginalized peoples. The refugee crisis is a test for humanity and unfortunately we're failing miserably everywhere across the globe. The need to change the global discourse and promote empathy, compassion, and humanity in our societies is more acute than ever, as we cannot escape the connection with our fellow human beings in the face of an increasingly insecure world. The need to help others should not be pursued through the prism of superiority, looking down on the unfortunate um, as barbaric, inferior, and uncivilized. It should be within the framework of a global citizen who has the privilege and tools to contribute to the restoration of humanity, working with local actors who truly understand the strength and weaknesses of their societies. It is our responsibility to assist those who are trapped in a, pris a prison of social political paralysis, conflict, and de-development. Assistance should not be in the form of military intervention or the demonization of the unfortunate other, but through sincere engagement in developing the necessary tools such as education, political institutions, and economic development for progress. It is crucial to fight global inequality and reduce the gap between the haves and the have-nots. The rescue of the Thai soccer team from the cave is a true cosmopolitan moment. The world came together and disregarded ethnic, cultural, and religious differences, all in the name of humanity. 
When the Thai people prayed and offered gifts to the spirits, the world reported with no prejudice and embraced the Thai boys as their own. I know Jumana quoted um, Ain Césaire yesterday, but I will continue to quote him because I think this is such a great quote. I was so disappointed, but I think I'm glad that you did. Uh, we get to remind everyone of, you know, of this great quote. Um, but the work of man is only just beginning, and it remains to conquer all the violence entrenched in the recesses of our passion. And no race possesses the monopoly of beauty, of intelligence, of force, and there is a place for all at the rendezvous of victory. I will end by looking at the story of you know, the dramatis Terence, a Roman playwright, narrated by Kwame Apeya in a lecture. And Kwame Apeya is a philosopher who looks at cosmopolitanism as well. Um, dramatis Terence was a former slave from Roman Africa. He was a Latin interpreter of Greek comedies, a writer from classical Europe, he called himself Terence the African, and he wrote, I am human, I think nothing human, alien to me. I would echo Kwame Abeya's sentiment, now there's an identity worth holding on to. Thank you. such a way that creates, you know, more thought-provoking, challenging, probing questions for us to move forward. Um, it's an extraordinary lecture and, uh, you know, a great credit to your erudition and knowledge that you brought this massive material together in such a way that you've enriched us all. So please um, join me again in thanking you. Days, an appropriate way to draw the themes together um, for the two-day symposium. Again, I'd like to thank Ron O'Neill and Katrina McKenzie and their advisory group for this year's symposium. So please thank them. Um, just quickly again, thanks to Macquarie University, the State Library of New South Wales and the associate sponsors uh, who have made this event possible. I have a few words now about uh, next year. Uh, if you look in the printed program uh, in the inside cover, you'll see that the Academy will be celebrating its 50th anniversary in 2019. You will not hear the end of this. This will be a fact that will be tattooed on your mind. Um, and with good reason, because we are working on the theme of humanising the past, present and future. That is our theme for the symposium, or sorry, for the year. Uh, our anniversary um, obviously provides a great opportunity for us to acknowledge past events, reflect on where we are at the present, and consider the role um, that the humanities can play in humanising the future. No more permanent issues than to blight this moment. So we will be embarking on a program of, um, uh, of events throughout the year to celebrate the humanities, arts and culture, uh, and, uh, to the sector and to national life, and um, you'll be getting updates about that program, and we'll be saying more about that at the AGM. Some of the highlights are noted in the program with the flagship event, um, put in your diaries now, the 50th Symposium called Humanising uh, the Future to be hosted in Brisbane on the 14th and 15th of November 2019. So, it's just my final duty to thank everyone here for participating in this memorable and extraordinary symposium and we look forward to seeing you uh, throughout 2019 during our anniversary year. Thank you very much. Thank you.